Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to go over how to do the HR Diagram Lab. Okay, so the H HR Diagram Lab is a NAAP lab, so um, with the Nebraska Astronomy Applet Project. Um, if you've uh, done mini astronomy labs before, you've probably already used one of their labs. Um, I have many videos talking about them. Um, and the one that we're doing is um, labeled under the number nine, Hertzsprung Russell, because that's the full name, HR is the acronym. So we'll go ahead and click on there. Here is the student guide. This is uh, what you're gonna be working on. All right, you can see here that in this class, it was lab 14, um, but the, uh, the number doesn't matter. So you can see there's background information as there are in many of these labs. Um, the main thing you're going to be doing is actually looking at a famous graph, a famous diagram um, called the HR diagram that really summarizes most of the key information about stars all in one diagram. Similarly to how the periodic table summarizes so much information, so much information about all the different elements in a single diagram. All right, so here are some examples of the HR diagram shown over here. It always will have luminosity on the vertical axis. Um, this represents um, the um, intensity. So the actual units of luminosity are watts per square meter. And then on the horizontal axis is spectral class or temperature or both. Um, if it's the temperature, as it is in this case, it's going to be in Kelvin, most more than likely. And interestingly, due to the way the spectral classes were discovered, we actually have the higher temperature on the left and the lower temperature on the right. So the numbers get bigger as they move to the left, left which is not typical. Um, so do uh, make sure to be aware of that. All right, here is a, another version that um, adds what are called isoradius curves. So they're actually um, showing these straight lines that any star within two bands is within that radius or that range of radii. If you can make it out, um, it's going to be one radii um, on this line right here. That would be um, based off of a stellar radius um, or the solar radius, so the radius of our sun. And then up here is um, 10. So it's what's called logarithmic scale or powers of 10. Um, so you can see this line here is 0.1, the radius of our sun. Um, likewise, by the way, the, um, the vertical axis, the luminosity, also scaled relative to the luminosity of, um, well, scaled to our, our sun. Uh, in this case, it's different units because it's luminosity. So in that sense, one is our sun. So if I draw a horizontal line, sure enough, I'm gonna get to that little um, you know, red dash right there, you know, the crosshairs. And that is none other than where our sun is located among all the other different type of stars that can exist in the main, um, in some particular, particular categories, um, including, um, you can see here like red dwarfs, and um, and then over here we have what are called dwarfs, um, but really are a main sequence. It's kind of unusual to call them dwarfs, but they are class five. Then we have supergiants and giants and then white dwarfs. All right, so compared to giants, uh, main sequence stars are dwarfs, but they're more, more, more likely or more often called the main sequence. And that is um, in fact, that big green swath across the middle of this diagram. Every little dot here is a star. There's not any stars in this range of luminosity and temperature. The stars don't exist with those particular values. But they, they certainly follow this trend, this big, um, you know, kind of curving line across the middle. And those are all the stars that are turning hydrogen into helium, which is what most stars do and what stars do during most of their lives. So the main sequence makes up over 90% of the population of known stars. It's the main sequence because that's most of what stars do. All right, and we can even um, see here another little special indicator you can put on the HR diagram is the instability strip. This is where the, uh, the very famous type of star called Cepheid variables are located, um, which uh, we'll talk about more when we talk about the cosmic distance ladder, which is another lab. All right, so then we have, that's all within um, the background information. And there's also, um, you have a, um, a stellar luminosity calculator, which you can actually adjust. This is a, um, a controllable, um, a demonstration here, controllable background um, illustration. All right, and um, so you can turn it all the way up to this spectral class O. So O are the hottest stars, B are the second hottest, all right? Then down to A, F are stars in the middle in terms of their temperature range. As we continue to get down, we can see that we have different temperature stars getting colder and colder, all the way down to the coldest stars, which are the M class stars, all right? We can see that as you slide it, there's actually other numbers given here. These are the subcategories within each of the, um, the spectral classes, all right? Um, and as far as terminology goes, those Roman numerals you saw on the HR diagram, those are called types. 
So you know, I was saying that you know dwarfs are tight five, also you know main, also known as main sequence, but both of them would agree those are tight five stars. So stars are divided into their class and their type. All right, um, and but uh, class is going to relate to temperature though, so you have that nice direct relationship. Um, and then what's cool about this calculator is it's actually going to put the temperature in. It's going to um, give you the appropriate radius um, because for a given class star, there's going to be a corresponding radius. So depending on where the star is on the HR diagram, then we know what its radius is. Okay, just note in that those are based on like the, the features of the star and kind of confirmation of, of similar stars and so on. And so all through the classes. All right. And by the way, the, the hottest stars, they shine blue or even ultraviolet. And the coldest stars are going to shine um, in the red um, with their peak wavelength, probably in the infrared, but visible in the red. All right. They're going to be dim, cold, and small. Um, and then, oh, yeah, this one doesn't auto adjust your radius. I misspoke when I said that. You actually control it independently over here. And that, that's, that's representing the fact that you could say have a, well, what's a, a good example, right? Right here. So you have a K stat, K, um, uh, type star, spectral type star. So you have um, the um, spectral spectral class um, um, here, right? So spectral type, but you often hear um, referred to as spectral class. So you have a K4, right? So what is that, right? Well, that, that just refers to the temperature. But if you look at the HR diagram, you can actually have K types, um, which is a temperature of 4,560 Kelvin that are either on the main sequence or are red giants or are hypergiants, all right? So are supergiants. So you can see, sure enough, if you look in that temperature range, which is just short of 5,000, this is where K would be if we were to put it on the horizontal axis. Well, if I drew a vertical line, then I'm, a, I'm gonna cross through lots of different types of stars, stars in the main sequence and the giants and the supergiants. So that means that you could have a K-type star with a radius you know, around that of the sun. You could have a K-type star with a radius that's maybe five times more than the sun, kind of right in this category. And you could even have an, a um, K-type star that is um, with a radius that's over a hundred times that of the sun. So you have a really huge range there. So if we go back um, to that little calculator, what's neat about that is that, that the luminosity varies really dramatically. So if we go over to K, right, and we look at the different, um, different types, then if we control this, um, this value here, we can see the luminosity varies. So if we have a K type that is really small, one of those little red dwarfs, we can see it's not very luminous at all. Indeed, it's about three ten thousandths as luminous as our sun, right? So these little tiny, very cold stars, they're very common. They're the most abundant type of star out there, um, but they're just not very bright. Don't, not, don't put off a lot of energy, at least not compared to our sun. Certainly they would still be plenty to heat a planet, but the planet would have to be much closer than say Earth is to the sun. And then we can go all the way up, as I mentioned, to you know some extreme example of 100, right? And that's a star could certainly exist like that. And notice the luminosity has changed really dramatically. Now, instead of having a 10,000th the luminosity of our sun, we have 30,000, right? Um, actually, 3,000, because it's 10 to the 3. But regardless, we have 3,000 times brighter than our sun, putting out 3,000 times more energy. And one of the reasons we see such a big difference is because we have dependence on both radius, squared dependence for the luminosity, and dependence on the temperature to the fourth power. So mathematically, this means that the luminosity is really going to shoot up as those two things change, the radius and the temperature, if they go up, or both, you know, the luminosity will also fall off precipitously if they both go down, right? But you can have combinations thereof. Um, and that's one of the things you're going to be messing around with here are those spectral types, looking at the colors, looking at those temperatures, right? So the things we've been talking about, looking at radius, luminosity is all in the background. Then you get right into, there's not as much background as some of these labs, well, you get right into the actual exercises within the, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The explorer, all right, the simulator, okay? So now we've opened up the simulator, it's always a separate window. And there's a number of things that, um, that you're gonna be asked to do. Um, so one thing, let's see, so check the appropriate regions, the ASAR diagram, corresponding to each description below. Um, so you could get this from the background. You actually would not need a simulator for question four. Then, then, however, you're going, to, you're going to drag the active location around on the HR diagram. Once again, this time, focus on the size comparison panel. All right. So if we're going to be, um, this is uh, what we can move around, right? So we can actually move all over here on the diagram. And we can see that, you know, we have some really dramatic differences, right? When the stars get so big, if our sun was next to them, you could hardly even see their curvature, right? It, might, it would just look like a wall compared to our sun if it was that close. And then we can get ones that are tiny. All the way down over here, there's actually those uh, dead stars, husks of stars, medium-sized stars um, called white dwarfs, and they exist right over here, right? Not a lot of luminosity, right? Very little size. And notice as I go along this diagonal line, the size doesn't change at all. I have to go on a vertical line 
or a horizontal line for the size to change. Okay, so they want you, you're going to explore that. You're going to look for um, a different color. So actually, the, the diagram is good for exploring this, although you could have gotten for the background information, especially as you can see here in the simulator, the color is representative. So as you move to different parts of the HR diagram, you're going to get a representative, representative stellar color of what that star would look like, all right, to, to the human eye, right? So the, the visible light being produced all the way up to the extreme end here. This red curve represents the middle of that main sequence, which are the, um, the type five stars, right? So anything along this red line is definitely a real star. As we know, there are special cases of stars that exist in clumps out here, and they get um, produced by particular conditions of stars when they start to die. So this is all where we have stars that are running out of fuel, in fact, okay, in this region. And then as we talked about, there's actually no stars over here. This is not a real star. There's no known stars that would match these characteristics, for example, where I have the red X. All right, um, then you're gonna go back to that luminosity calculation. You're going to discuss um, why it makes sense based on the, um, the what you've been seeing, all right? Um, and as far as um, the simulator here, you can see that we, um, we got the luminosity is um is outputted as we move right so if i drag it around on the hi diagram that luminosity bar moves accordingly right so likewise if i just change this the luminosity it's just going to call cause vertical motion because this particular bar is the same as just strictly vertical motion in the same way as changing the temperature bar causes horizontal motion so you have direct control over there because that's what the axes are you do also have a calculation here because as we as we saw as you can calculate luminosity based on temperature and radius which is more likely what you're going to be doing but if you know luminosity and you want to like prove the relationship or, or or find radius backwards that's what this formula is here is here for so this formula is showing um the radius values based on luminosity and temperature and what's important and relevant of showing this is it showing um first of all you know the changing value so it's a live readout based on wh whatever the two uh, numbers are up above which you could also manually input with your keyboard but also um it shows us that we are going to fall into these categories, right? So when you, again, when we're between these diagonal lines, we're between a hundredth and a tenth, the radius of the sun. When I move over here, sure enough, now I'm at a, a value that would be about 25% the radius of the sun, okay? And so on, okay? So then you're gonna look at the relationship between luminosity and mass, right? So we haven't talked about that much. We've, we've, fo we've been focusing on everything except mass. Um, so where, where does mass figure into things? Well, it turns out there's about a three-fifths relationship. And especially when on the main sequence, and we can see here, this is just referring to the main sequence. Technically, it's actually only one part of the main sequence, but it's a good, it's a good average of kind of representative middle-sized stars. So we're saying that if you stay right on this red line and you move up it, you're going to find this relationship between luminosity and mass, okay? Now, if we take a look over here, we've got luminosity, magnitude, we have temperature, spectral type, we've talked about, we can just, you know, they're interchangeable. This is just referring to the actual um, color index in terms of um, scales. So let's then take a look. Okay, so um, I guess this, um, this is all gonna be based on the background panel, and then just, you know, and you'll write a conclusion about it on what, what you've been doing in the HR diagram. Then you're gonna fill in some information here. This is obviously one of the more, uh, you know, kind of, um, bigger figures you're going to work on. Um, you're going to draw some arrows showing the directions and directions of increasing mass, all right, increasing radius, and so on. All right, do you want to confirm you can show all of those trends? All right, um, then you're going to turn on the instability strip, which is one of the options down here. All right, so you can do that. All right, you can also turn on luminosity classes. Okay, yeah. So you can see that there's a little bit different different terminology, right? Luminosity class. Um, you know, I, obviously I was calling those um, types of stars, right? And then I call the, um, I call the other ones the, um, the spectral, spectral class. So it's interesting to see the, the term switched. Depends on who you ask, I suppose. Um, yep. And then the, you can turn on those isoradius lines, which I was referring to. Okay. All right. There's no way to turn on mass, but you can, you can make that calculation. Because again, if, as long as you're on the red line, there should be a direct, you can, in other words, directly calculate out of the simulator, whatever the luminosity value is because you know that the mass is just proportional to it, raised to the three-fifth power, okay? All right, um, then you're going to take a look at the nearest stars, the brightest stars, and, make, and draw some conclusions from that. So there's an, some options down here about which stars you can plot. So um, by the default, if I tur uh, turn off, um, let's just turn off everything except for the main sequence. And if there's no stars, then there's simply no stars, and the red crosshair is just whatever value I've chosen. But I can turn on the nearest stars, see where they are. I can turn on the brightest stars and see where they're located, okay, relative to the main sequence and other parts of the HR diagram. I can even turn back on the luminosity glasses to gain more information. 
then I can um, put on both the brightest and the nearest. And I can even look at when those two groups overlap, just the overlap. So these are stars that, that are both of those, all right? Which also get highlighted here with the both the nearest. So they get a special color of red. You can just turn them on on their own. And so based on what you see and how that matches all the background information, as long as you do the reading, then you'll definitely understand what the, what the lab is asking you here with uh, some of these final calculations, all right? Then you're actually going to derive the isoradius lines based on a cool mathematical idea that, in fact, this is a logarithmic scale. So what is the meaning of a line here, right? Because it's linear on one axis, on the temperature axis. Um, well, actually, it's not linear, but it's linear to a different power, all right? And then it's, um, it's power 10 logarithmic on this axis here, all right? And then, so based on that, you can uh, come up with this relationship. Obviously, they do a lot of the work for you, so you're just going to going to be applying the steps that are shown here. You can, you can um, review what they did if you want to see. These are laws of logarithms, essentially the steps that are being carried out, especially here, where they turn um, multiplication within the logarithm into addition outside. A uh, really neat step here and cool idea to consider when you're working with log scales, uh, which are a very important scale. Um, then you have your own uh, blank version of the HR diagram, and you're asked to uh, add some information based on uh, question 16, some particular values um, that you're going to look up and plop them, because that's just a good way to kind of finish off the lab. All right, well, there you go. It's pretty detailed, detailed directions on what to expect. Hopefully, hopefully that gives you a good start if you're, uh, if you're stuck on this one. Thank you so much for watching this help video. Bye for now.